welcome to My Brain is a Wonderland, the podcast for neurodivergent women and the people who love them. You're here with your host, Emily, and it is Thanksgiving week this week. I was going to say Thanksgiving day, but I think I'm going to release this a day earlier on the Wednesday. And before we get started, I just wanted to apologize. There is only going to be one episode this week. I was supposed to do the normal episode today on the Wednesday, and I was going to do a film fixation of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles tomorrow for Thanksgiving Day, and I'm sorry if I disappointed anyone, but I unfortunately will not be doing that. Time kind of got away from me. I have a lot going on at work right now, and I have school classes ending this week, a couple of days after Thanksgiving, so I just didn't have the time to get to the film fixation. I honestly was about, I don't know, eight minutes into the movie and had already spent, you know, 30 minutes pausing it, typing, and I just couldn't get it done in time with having to record it and everything. So instead, today, kind of in honor of my passions and what happened recently is I am going to do a recap of the first Friends Thanksgiving episode. That episode is season one, episode nine, and it's called The One Where Underdog Gets Away, which I always forget this is a Thanksgiving episode because I don't celebrate Thanksgiving, or I didn't before I came to the US. I do now. And I didn't know what a Thanksgiving parade was. I never saw it. I've seen it one time, and that's because a couple of years ago, or maybe four years ago, I knew someone who was dancing in the parade. So I watched it then. But other than that, I've never watched it. Didn't even really register that it existed and what it was, and would just see photos online after it happened. So I'm going to go through this episode, super beloved um, episode of Friends, and I hope you guys enjoy it. And also, before I get started again, don't forget to um, subscribe, follow, and leave a great five-star review. In a lot of places other than Apple, it's just five stars. And for anyone who's listening on YouTube, I have not been uploading episodes the last couple of weeks, and that is because I am finagling my RSSS feed to YouTube. Google Podcasts actually got shut down. I think they were bought by Google or or YouTube or vice versa or something. And so now YouTube is allowing podcasts to be streamed directly through their platform. So I'm going to set that up in the next week or so. They have to go through my ID, make sure I'm who I say I am and all that stuff. All right, so let's get started. Much like any other episode in Friends, it starts off with a view of the New York skyline and settles on Central Perk which is their coffee shop that they frequent all the time. Rachel is working at Central Perk. She has been since the first episode. This is episode nine. And she asked Terry, the Central Perk manager, who is a recurring character, and I'll have to bank in my mind for myself when he disappears and Gunther shows up, because Gunther ends up being the manager of Central Perk till the end of season 10. So I think for about nine years. So this guy, Terry, he's kind of a, I don't know why they got rid of him, really. But Rachel goes to Terry and says she needs an advance on her paycheck because usually she goes skiing in Vail, Colorado, every year with her family. If you know anything about Friends, the first season, Rachel is trying to kind of separate herself from her dad, his money, her family, become a little bit more independent. And so she's asking for an advance on her paycheck so that she can pay for the flight to Vail instead of her family. And Terry says, sweetheart, you're a terrible, terrible waitress. And basically, that's his way of saying no. Rachel thinks she's doing a pretty good job and that she's doing better than she has. And she calls out in Central Perk, does anyone need coffee? And almost everyone raises their hand. And so, yeah, she does not get that advance. Cut to the intro, the classic I'll be there for you intro, where they're kicking around in the water fountain and all that jazz. Cut back to Rachel at Central Perk. She starts asking regulars there for an advance on her tips. One man gives her a very dirty look and walks out. And when she picks up his tip, she says, that's only 98.50 to go. And this is when I paused it, got on Expedia, and said, excuse me, because 
98.50. I'm going to guess she saved about 50 bucks at most. Okay. So we're talking $150 return flight from New York City to Vail, Colorado at the holidays. So I decided I was just going to look it up now just to see. So I looked it up, New York City to Vail for this weekend, which is when you're doing it this close. I get it. It's you know, that's a tough one. Or I did it for Christmas weekend, which is like three weeks, four weeks out or whatever. Did it for a week, leaves in the middle of the week, which is cheaper than traveling on a weekend. And from New York to Vail, return was $972. So I honestly don't know if this is inflation in our face or if this is just movie money, the $150 in 1994 or five was enough to get a round trip between New York and Colorado, but that seems ludicrous to me. I I mean, I guess they have to factor in a lot more uh, monies now. Did they pay for TSA through flight tickets? I don't know. So anyway, that sounds crazy. So <laughs> Monica comes into Central Park and we see Phoebe Chandler and Ross are also hanging out there. And Monica asks Ross if she knows that their parents are actually going to Puerto Rico for Thanksgiving, and Ross is not happy. And I think we all remember that first time where it's usually either Thanksgiving or Christmas. In the UK, it could be like Christmas or Easter. It really just depends what you celebrate the most with your family. But you'll remember the first time your parents, parent, whoever you're used to going to their house for the holidays, said, I'm going to go see your sibling in another state. I'm going to take a vacation with my best friend. Like, where it shakes you almost to your core because you're used to going home every year for Thanksgiving. Or like they say, we sold the house or something. Just like pulls the rug from out of you and I think people who run holidays like Thanksgiving Christmas are like I cannot wait for one day where I don't have to do it if you've been doing it for like 20 years 30 40 years like Ross and Monica's parents have you know to them it might seem like oh it's not a big deal we'll just go on vacation they can do it themselves but it really is I mean the fir- I remember the first time um, my in-laws didn't do Thanksgiving And we went to my sister-in-law instead. And me and my sister-in-law were kind of like, okay, I guess we're doing this alone. It was really different. Um, We're not doing that this year. We are going to be at my husband's childhood home with one of his siblings. The other one can't make it. And a lot of family. So that'll be great. But Ross basically runs off to call their mom because he cannot believe that Thanksgiving is not going to happen at their house. Then Joey walks in. I don't know if it's clear that he's wearing makeup, but he does look a little bit different. But to everyone there, they're like, dude, you're wearing makeup. And he says he's becoming an actor slash model because he really was a mo- uh, an actor, excuse me. But I think he needs to make more money. So he's got the looks for it. He could be a model. Chandler makes fun of him for being a man slash woman, which is one of those jokes that you're like, meh was funny at the time. It's funny how you deliver it. Not that funny now. And what we find out is Joey is modeling for New York City's free clinic. So he's going to have a certain illness or disease on this poster, and he's hoping that he's going to be Lyme disease because he's heard Lyme disease is up for grabs. So it's like one of those posters where you're like, it's a PSA. Joey has Lyme disease and you can get treated just like he did. So that's what he's hoping for. Ross is done with his telephone call with the parents. He comes rushing back over, and it is true. Their parents are going to Puerto Rico for Thanksgiving. And so to appease her brother, to help out, because Monica's a bit of a people pleaser, she offers to hold Thanksgiving at her apartment, the apartment, and cook just like mom. Ross says he wants mashed potatoes with lumps, which Monica says she'll struggle with. She is a professional chef. And she's like, you know, they're not supposed to like come with lumps, right? And honestly, if you don't create lumps on per, like, how do you do that? It's trying to create good mashed potatoes and then it comes out with the lumps. I don't know how you do that. Undercook the potatoes, I guess. I'm not really sure. Joey says he's going home for Thanksgiving, which I believe he's from Queens. So he's not going far, but he's going to spend that day with his family in Queens. 
And Chandler says he boycotts Thanksgiving and kind of alludes to that's what he always does and there's a reason for it. Phoebe says she'll be celebrating with her grandma and her grandma's boyfriend in December because the boyfriend is lunar, like L-U-N-A-R, suggesting that there's some, um, you know, other holiday calendar that they're following because they're a little hippy-dippy or what have you. Um, and so Monica says, so you're available then for Thanksgiving this Thursday. And Phoebe's like, oh, totally. Yeah, let's do it. Rachel says she won't be able to make it because of Veil, and now it's only $102 to go, not ninety-eight fifty because she just broke a cup. Mm. Poor Rachel. She's really not cut out for this hostessing vibe, is she? Then Ross leaves to go see Carol. Carol is his ex-wife, the woman who realized she was a lesbian, uh, cheated on Ross with a woman who is now her life partner. But right when she was breaking up with Ross, Carol realized she was pregnant with Ross's baby. And so now they are deciding to kind of raise this baby in a somewhat hostile threesome nature. Phoebe says, why don't we invite Carol to Thanksgiving? And Ross is like, uh, no, because she'll bring her life partner, Susan, who he doesn't like. We see Ross arrive at Carol's apartment, but she's not there. It's Susan who answers the door. Ross needs to pick up the skull from the museum he works at, he's a paleontologist, that Carol borrowed from him. She, like, used it in a lecture. I think she's a teacher as well or something, an academic. And so Susan and Ross start to look for it in the apartment. And there's this funny moment where Ross notices that and says, you have a lot of books about being gay. You know, so it's things like essays, feminist essays, things like that. And Susan says, well, you know, they make you take a course, otherwise they don't let you do it. Which, I think the whole way they set this up, this whole situation is a victim of the 90s, it's a victim of a lot of different things. I think Ross is treated unfairly in some ways. Um, He seemed like an alright husband, even though he's very jealous and kind of crazy. But he seemed like a fine husband, cheating on him, and then having to witness your ex-wife that you're still in love with raise your baby with the woman you cheated on, you came out as gay. Like, Susan's really not nice to him. And uh, it's just, there's uncomfortable tension there where you're like, whoa, dude, like, I don't know. He he just was here and, you know, had sex with your lesbian lover or whatever. But there's a lot to unpack there. They're walking around the apartment, uh, still looking for the skull. And Ross sees the book, Yurtle the Turtle, which I've never heard of, but I think this is a popular kid's book or baby book. And Susan tells Ross that she's reading the baby, reading the book to the baby, which is still in Carol's belly. This baby hasn't been born. And Ross makes fun of her. But Susan says, the baby can hear sounds and I want the baby to hear my voice. And of course, Ross gets jealous, right? Because he's like, well, you're talking to the baby, this woman that's not, you know, it's not your baby in Ross's mind, like you cheated with my wife, you stole her, you stole my baby, like, I don't want you this close to my kid, which I get. They've got to work this out in the end and they do. Um, You see it in future seasons, but I get um, Ross's animosity there, but he is a very jealous guy, so that kind of comes up in a lot of difficult ways. But Ross is jealous, and he's like, do you talk about the baby? Do you talk about me to the baby? And Susan says, yeah, we refer to you as Bobo the sperm guy. Uh, It's just like jab after jab between these guys. Right when, right then, Ross is about to leave, and as he walks out the door, he snaps the head of one of the lilies in their vase. It's so petty, so funny. He's just like, eh, like, eh, you're not gonna notice, but I'll feel good about it. It's just so funny. We cut to Monica's apartment. It is nighttime, and Ross is there. He's upset about this whole belly baby thing. He's jealous, but he also doesn't actually believe that the baby can hear anything. Monica, I believe this is probably Thanksgiving Eve, because they have the turkey out, and so they're probably defrosting it, getting it ready, all that stuff. And Phoebe says, oh, I believe in talking to the baby in the belly, and she tells Ross to put his head inside the turkey, and then they'll all talk, and he'll be able to hear what they say. Ross literally is staring at Phoebe like, I don't, this chick, this chick. But she's not wrong. I mean, that is a way to prove to him that it works. Rachel gets home. 
and she's upset because she has not made enough money to go skiing. But guess what? All of the friends have gathered together to get her the hundred dollars that she needs for her ski ticket. So bank this again. This is Thanksgiving Eve, and she's going to book a ticket, return round trip, from New York City to Vail, Colorado, on one of the most popular ski weeks in history. And she's going to pay 150 bucks the night before? Okay, I don't, I, I don't know what you're saying. This is madness. Then Monica is grabbing a bag and she's giving Chandler his Thanksgiving food. She says, here's your tomato soup, your grilled cheese fixins, and a family-sized bag of Funyuns. Which, as a British person, I honestly don't really know what a Funyun is. It's either a crispy chip that's flavored like onion, or it's like an onion ring in a bag. I have no idea. But it's fun. It's onion. It's a Funyun. Rachel asks Chandler, because she's new to the group, right? This is season one. A lot of people have known Chandler for a long time. Rachel's new to the group uh, nine episodes ago, eight episodes ago. And she says, what is your deal with hating on Thanksgiving? Like, this is so bizarre. You know, you can, I mean, you can hate on it for, you know, the pilgrim thing. It's like, well, it's uncomfortable. You can be like, this is not how it went down. Historical whitewashing, blah, blah. But like, is it that? What is going on? And so Chandler goes, so I'm nine years old, and everyone other than Rachel just is like, uh You can tell they've heard this story like a million times. He says his family had just finished Thanksgiving dinner, Chandler had a mouthful of pumpkin pie, and his parents tell him that he's getting that they're getting divorced. Now, I didn't grow up in a situation like this where I had two parents together married and then they got divorced, but what I have heard is that That is very traumatic, Um, learning about it, um, going through it, having to deal with separate homes, separate lives, the relationship between your parents, your siblings. I get that. Um, He grew up pretty wealthy and seems like later on his parents were pretty loving. So it's hard to kind of be like, well, what, what, what happened there? But divorce is trauma, man. Uh, from what I've read and heard from people who've been through it and just reading about it, it sounds traumatic. Like your parents are together and then they're not and your world is just broken apart. So I get that. But we also have that friend that's always a little bit over dramatic. So <laughs> you can tell the other friends are like, dude, and maybe this is a 90s thing. You know, maybe now they'd be like, okay, are you okay? Or like, what did your therapist say? (laughs) But with this, they're just like, dude, would you shut up? You know? Then we cut to Joey at the subway station. And I think they're suggesting that he's traveling back to Queens for Thanksgiving. I'm not sure, but that's kind of what I assumed. And he sees a woman sitting on the bench at the subway. She looks kind of French. She turns out not to be. She just has a beret on, short, dark hair. She's just giving 90s French vibes. And, uh, Joey realizes they worked at as fragrance sprayers at a department store together. There's a whole episode where Joey's like, Aramis? Aramis? Like spraying, trying to spray people in the store. He's working his magic with this woman. They're flirting. It's happening. He's in. He's like, should we get out of here? And she's like, hell yeah, dude. As they're leaving the station together, she abruptly bails on him. It's just like, uh, no, I'm good. Bye. He turns around and he sees that his modeling gig for the city has been released and the disease, you remember it was supposed to be like a PSA, like, I have Lyme disease, but I cured it and here's how, at the city clinic. He has VD, which is venereal disease, which is an STD. I mean, it's like the worst one to have. And then we see a montage, classic montage, 90s montage, music playing, and all these posters are being posted all over the city. Which is good for him, I guess, for modeling and money, but not good for his social life. Joey comes back to Central Perk, and he's not happy, and he sees all of the friends laughing at Central Perk, and they're laughing about him. And he says, what are you laughing at? And Phoebe's like, we're just laughing. You know how laughter can be infectious. They all start laughing again. It's really sad. And we later see Joey asking if he can come to Monica's Thanksgiving because his entire family actually now thinks that he has VD. Oh, that's sad. All right, then we cut to Thanksgiving Day. The parade is in full swing and on TV and we see some shots of it that I think are real shots of the parade, not filmed for the show. 
Monica and Phoebe are cooking. I think more so Monica's cooking and Phoebe's assisting. And we see Ross is doing something at the table to help, and Joey's eating marshmallows. He's eating mini marshmallows. Chandler's just standing by the doorway, you know, with contempt on Thanksgiving. Rachel comes home super excited because she has her tickets for skiing, and she needs to grab her stuff, grab her bag, all that kind of stuff. Chandler's standing there being all grumpy, and Phoebe taunts him with a pumpkin pie until he leaves. He's done. He's over this Thanksgiving. Joey asks where the tater tots are, the way his mom used to make. So now Monica, after he gives a sob story, Monica decides I'll make mashed potatoes with the lumps for Ross and tater tots for Joey. Ross decides he's going to head out to go talk to his baby in Carol's belly. And as he leaves, Monica sees that Phoebe is whipping all of the lumps out of the mashed potatoes because that's how her mom used to make them with peas and onions. After a little bit of discussion, Monica frustratingly says, says, fine, I will make whipped potatoes with peas and onions, mashed potatoes with lumps, and tater tots. Right then, Chandler rushes back in. Underdog, the giant inflatable balloon at the parade, has gotten loose and is floating around the city. He says we have to go to the roof to go watch it. Rachel's not sure she has to leave for a flight, but he's like, come on, this never happens. So Chandler, Joey, Monica, Phoebe, and Rachel, because Ross has gone off to Carol's, run to the roof to go check it out. And as they're running out the door, Rachel's last out and Monica shouts, got the keys? Cut to, well, remember that part. Got the keys? Got the keys? Got the keys? Got the keys? I don't know. Cut to Ross. He's staring at Carol's belly. He's super uncomfortable with talking to the baby. He doesn't think he can do it. But just as Carol mentions that Susan does it, his jealousy kicks in and he's like, okay, fine. We cut back to Monica's apartment and we see everyone heading back down from the roof after seeing the underdog balloon get shot down over the city. And Monica asks Rachel for the apartment keys. Rachel says she does not have them. They argue and Monica says, I said got the keys. That's, you know, with an keys like question when they all left and rachel's like no you said got the keys like you had the keys so it was like mm. monica starts panicking because all the food is on in the oven rachel is panicking because she has her ticket in the door in the apartment she can't go to her flight but joey says he has a copy of their key meanwhile ross is talking to his baby through carol's belly about how he picked paleontology on a dare there's some backstory there and Carol says, try singing to the baby, which Ross is like, oh, whatever. And then Susan walks in and he starts going, hey, hey, with the monkeys. That is from a TV show called The Monkeys. This is totally aging me here. Uh, I watched this many Sundays growing up in the UK. They were basically, they were an American, they were an American TV show band. They were a band that had a TV show. They were a TV show band that became a band. I'm not sure chicken or the egg i'm not sure but they basically look like the beatles they were like the american version of the beatles and i love this song so it's just so funny to me that he sings it there's no context at all like if you didn't know the show you wouldn't know what he was singing and he's singing everyone gathers around it's carol it's ross it's susan and the baby starts kicking for the very first time they all get super excited they all gather around, put their hands on Carol's belly, and feel the baby kick for the first time. And it's, like, super adorable. They're kind of joking with each other. It's really cute. Meanwhile, at Monica's apartment, Joey is trying his many spare keys on their door. He said he had their spare key, but he has, like, a million of them. Rachel and Monica start arguing about who should have grabbed the key. And Monica just starts to, like, freaking lose it. She's so overwhelmed from, you know, not going home for Thanksgiving having it be their first Thanksgiving, having to cook all these different things. She's like, does anyone care about what kind of potatoes I want? And she starts like just making sounds, <laughs> like squeaky, <laughs> like sounds. And Chandler says, okay, only dogs can hear you now. And right when he says that, Joey gets the door open. So they rush into Monica's apartment. It's super smoky. All the food is burnt. All three types of potatoes are burnt. Ross walks in singing because he's high as a kite on life and is very confused by the smoke. 
And Rachel is freaking out because she's missed her flight. So she will not be going to Vale. I think that is one of the things we can guarantee at this point. Even if you can get a $150 round trip ticket the day before Thanksgiving, if you miss your flight at this point, you's in trouble. Joey says, hey, this was nobody's first choice. Ouch. And so Monica's like, well, why was I even, you know, doing this? Everyone's arguing. And then Monica starts stamping her feet. And Chandler says, now it feels like a real Thanksgiving, like super dramatico. We cut to a little while later and everyone's upset and quiet, seated alone in Monica's apartment, just ignoring each other. And then Phoebe says that she sees ugly naked guy, the guy across the street in his apartment that they spy on, taking his turkey out of the oven. And then she says, oh my God, he's not alone. He's with ugly naked gal. And so everyone gathers by the window, and they feel super heartwarmed, and they see Ugly Naked Guy and Ugly Naked Gal dancing together, and it makes them feel connected, and they kind of hug each other and touch each other. I mean, you know, like, on their shoulder. (laughs) Just kind of pat their shoulders, and they're like, love you, man. We cut to Thanksgiving dinner, probably, I don't know, 30 minutes later. Chandler is carving up a big pile of grilled cheeses from his Thanksgiving meal. Monica and Joey decide to split their grilled cheese, and Phoebe says they have to make a wish like it's a wishbone. Chandler proposes a toast to all his friends. Instead of being apart, they are together. Because everything went wrong, they are together. Aww. They toast, the credits roll, And it shows Joey sneakily trying to rip down the bottom part of his poster that has the VD thing on it in the subway. And all these other ones come, like, he's ripping off the bottom part and it says, like, bladder control problems. He rips it off again. It's like, you're psychotic or something. And he keeps ripping the bottom off until it gets to winner of three Tony Awards. He's happy with that. And the episode is done. And that is the first Thanksgiving episode on Friends, which I super recommend if you're feeling Thanksgiving-y. There's a bunch of, every season has a Thanksgiving episode. I don't even know that this one's the best one. I just wanted to start with the first one. And just for everyone listening, I did start a new Instagram page. I'm obsessed with Friends. You probably got that if you listened to my Matthew Perry episode. And I started a new Instagram called Our Friends Food, O-U-R. F-R-I-E-N-D-S-F-O-O-D, Our Friends Food. And it's all about, um, it's a recap of every single food and drink item that is consumed on every episode of Friends. There is a lot of Instagram pages about clothing that recaps all of the outfits you see, so I decided to do a food one. So I'd love you guys to follow me on Our Friends Food. You can also find me almost anywhere on all social media platforms under My Brain is a Wonderland. If you'd like to reach out, my email is mybrainisawonderlandpod at gmail.com. And just to give a little heads up to everybody, I'm not sure when, but I think I'm going to do season two through until around Christmas. And then I'm going to take two or three weeks break off from the podcast because I need a little bit of a break. And also, I'm hoping to get a new microphone, a better microphone, for Christmas so that I can start season three with an even better sound, a cleaner sound, um, without having to do a lot of editing. So stay tuned for that. I'll let you know in the next two or three weeks when that's going to happen. And I hope all of you have a great Thanksgiving. Eat all the things you love. Enjoy your time with family. Go shut yourself in a bathroom if you need to. That's what I do to get away. No one will bother you in there, I promise. And I'll see you again on My Brain is a Wonderland, Season 2.